Good morning, everyone. Yes, it is a good morning. Though, as you will hear during the prayer time, it's been a difficult week for our congregation. And so um, I really appreciate the fact that everyone is getting used to letting me know, you know, whether they will be joining us in worship or not. It was just a few too many people who did that this week. But when you hear the prayers, it's like, Lord, we are a wonderful family-sized congregation. Don't you think we're kind of doing more than our share in these areas here? And that perhaps it should be spread around or something a bit more. And so um, we will hear about that as we get to our prayer time. So let's look at our announcements today as we begin um, this week. I know that we have Hot Meals Ministry on Monday night. And anyone who would like to ever come and see that experience and be part of it is more than welcome to join us. We can always use extra volunteers. Um, if you would like details about Maranatha, um, Lori is down as you'll hear in prayer time and, um, and Karen is working because it's now fair time. But if you give either one of them a call, they can give you the details for what is coming up for Maranatha. And then you notice our other activities coming up, including next week. Oh, do we want to miss the board meeting? Not at all. Chris is excited and ready to go and just can't wait to have all of us there. Everyone is invited to attend board meeting while only actual board members may vote. And having said that, Chris is our elder today. Please stand if you're able and join me in the call to worship. Oh God, we give you thanks for all you have done for us. You have created us and have given us the gift of life. We have been given this wonderful earth to live upon, to rejoice, renew, and relax in. And you have given us work to do and the strength to do it to maintain this beautiful world. For this, this and, and so much more, we, we give, give you thanks, thanks. We, give we give you praise. praise. of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let us be joined in a time of prayer. Heavenly Father, once again we are gathered together. Whether we are here in person or here in spirit, we are joined together as a family as we worship you, as we praise you, as we lift up the hallelujahs to you. 
knowing that you are there for us and each and every day we live, each and every step we take. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to worship, to praise, to gather together, to sing, to hear the scriptures, to fellowship, for being part of the family of God is one of the greatest gifts that anyone can ever have in their life. So Lord, let us be enriched by this service and then having been filled with the spirit from this experience, let us find ways to go forth and share that with others. For everyone, whether they are inside our building or not, needs the loving touch of God in their life. Amen. with us today and so we will move on from our youth moment into that time of prayer not having to go through life alone is one of the greatest things about being part of the family of God that no matter what comes into your life what happens into your life whether it's a joy you want to celebrate in or whether it's a concern a weight that you need help bearing knowing that we can pray as a church family and that we as your church family members the holy spirit god will take care of you and help you through that in our prayer concerns this week we want to lift up our family uh, charlie's sister corrine had another setback in her battle against cancer developed a blood clot in her leg that is de being dealt with at this time as you know we've been praying for her for quite some time in her battle with cancer and so that was a real blow to have yet another um, item come up with them and as if that was a nod and how many are animal people here who love their cats and dogs and things that uh, you know, Dorothy and Charlie had to put down their dog that they, they loved and was such a vital part of their family. Difficult for them and hard to explain to the little ones, you know, what has happened. And so we really want to pray with them. I want to lift up the name of Lori Hardin, and I want to use the image of a roller coaster. Um, her diabetes condition is going in a roller coaster up, down, up, down. She now has a specialist that does nothing but deal with people with this but she has one day where or one hour where things are going well and then the next minute the blood sugar has dropped and so she asks for our prayers as she just getting through a single day is difficult when that is happening prayers chris do you want to share about jeanette i have her on my list here no i i will we received the sad news that in Aunt Jeanette Walker's battle against cancer, they have found that rather than beating it back, it is now spread to another part of her body. It's now in her back. That was news that we were not expecting, not hoping for, and just is really devastating and all. She has fought so valiantly with that, and so we want to pray for all the surrounding family, and especially for Jeanette, as she deals with that latest information that goes on. And then before we get to our prayer times, our praise times, I talked to Norm this week, and you know, he could use continued prayers to envision a mountain of paperwork years old that has not been touched by her sister, his sister in the declining years that all must be dealt with as he's getting to work through her estate. And so his own health is difficult right now, everything to take care of the sister's estate in Arizona. So we really want to pray for Norm Todd during this time. Now, now on positive things, um, uh, Chris is getting rid of her daughter for a while and do. Adina, she of the beautiful voice, is it ensemble? Is that the right word or what do you call that? 
Cal State Fullerton University Choir is on their way to a musical tour of Australia tomorrow, and we are very excited about that. We have so benefited from her beautiful voice in our special worship services and all, and so we hope for Adina and the choir that it is a great experience and all. Any other prayer things? Judy, you want to lift up anything? Are you good? You're good. Okay, we're good. Yes. Thank you. So for the passing of an, un an uncle, you said. Yeah, who has passed away. Always difficult. We know that he has gone to be into the arms of Jesus, but the family that remains always has such a difficult time. Any other prayers that we might lift up? If not, let's be shared in the time of personal prayer. Dear Lord, as we gather together, when we are a family, which is how you best would describe our congregation, it is so hard when people are hurting. It is so hard when people are struggling. It is so difficult when people get that news that we do not want to hear. And Lord, oh, we offer our prayers of support to them knowing that you and your miraculous way are the ones that can work in their lives and help in each of the situations. We can offer our prayers of support and encouragement to them. We can offer our help to be there in any way we can. And Lord, help us to find ways that we can let them know that we are with them during this difficult time. So for each of those health and life concerns that have been lifted up, we share them with you and ask that you, you do your miraculous work to help for healings in each of the situations. And Lord, let us also take time to be thankful. Let us be thankful for young people like Adina and the choir. Let us be thankful for people who have special gifts that they share with others that bring joy and happiness into our life. Let us think about the things in life around us that bring a smile to our face, that make our eyes light up. Whether it's young children in church like today, or, or whether it's the flowers blooming or the butterflies flying or whatever, Lord, let us also always remember that there is beauty around us and signs of your work, and to keep those in our heart as well. Amen. you to join together in the reciting of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today I will be reading from Matthew chapter 13, verses 13 through 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented, and when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove 
and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading. Thank you for the beautiful music and and thank you for the little words of joy from the back pew over there and do robin just who is the little one here that we have oh the, you mean zephaniah zephaniah i mean the uh t- t- the talk about the very embodiment of answers of prayer and do little zephaniah the one who had the surgeries and is here with us okay Ah, talk about reasons for prayer. He has the most beautiful, big, proud eyes. He just stares at the pastor going, who is that man? So, ah. I wonder, yes, I wonder, if there has been a time in your life when you have taken a stand that is unpopular, A stand which goes against the grain of most of the people, the community, almost the entire world around you. Sort of like being a Dodger fan here in Angel Territory, you know. A stand, a stance, an opinion, a viewpoint, a position where everyone else believes one way and they believe it fervently and strongly and passionately but you just don't agree. In fact, you are adamant about the rightness of how you feel. In fact, to the very center of your soul, you feel that the way you believe is right. And to add to the legitimacy and strength to your side of the argument, the source of your belief is none other than the Bible, which tells you so. An example set by none other than Jesus and a man by the name of John the Baptist, 
who on a day that has gone down in history for records one of the most significant events in the life of Jesus and in fact of the entire Christian faith come together in the waters of the River Jordan where John had been baptizing all who came and desired to be so in a ritualized cleaning similar to the teachings of the Jewish faith of which he was a part, calling to each and every person as they entered the waters and approached him to repent, for the kingdom of heaven was at hand. To repent, meaning to make a conscious decision to express sincere regret or remorse about one's wrongdoing or sin and to commit yourself to attempting to lead a life as sin-free as one is capable of doing. And with that, John would take each person and he would immerse them into the waters. Essentially, and this symbolism only gets stronger at the end of the Jesus story, where Jesus has died, been placed in the tomb, raised up, was resurrected into new life, Essentially, in baptism, burying them beneath the waters, the convert no longer breathing while they're beneath the water, and then lifting them up, raising them up, allowing them to take their first breath of a new life with God at the very center of it. And it is that event, that process, that ritual done in that way that churches, in fact, entire denominations, though very few in number, now follow each and every time we baptize a new convert to the Lord. We, as disciples of Christ, practice baptism by immersion of believers who have personally made their confession of faith and Jesus the Christ as their Lord and Savior. But as I started out this sermon with, this is the belief that we as disciples hold, but very few other churches don't. By the way, if you don't know, that is the symbol of our den denomination there, the communion chalice with the cross of St. Andrew. We'll talk about that more in the next week or two. As I started out this sermon with, this is a belief that we as disciples hold, but very few other churches agree with us. The Catholics don't. The Lutherans, the Episcopalians, or either of the Orthodox churches. Neither do most of the Reformed churches agree with us. The Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Nazarene, even the Congregationalist. In fact, with a few exceptions, the Disciples, the Baptist, and, and yes, the Mormon church, we stand alone and believing in the process known as, and let me show off my limited knowledge of Latin here, we believe in credo baptism. From the Latin word creed, referring to the fact that to receive the rites of baptism, a person must be able to make a confession of faith, to state their creed on their own. Something that is not possible we believe in, to show my limited knowledge of Greek, Pedo-baptism, coming from the Greek word pais, which means child. But despite the numbers that disagree with us, this form of baptism, believers' baptism by immersion, is what we as disciples firmly believe in and feel strongly that the Bible supports. With most each and every example of baptism that you read about in the New Testament, being done in exactly this way. For example, in the story of the baptism of Jesus told to us in Matthew chapter 3, where even Jesus, the only begotten Son of God the Father, asked to be baptized at the hands of John and then is immersed in the River Jordan. As you read other stories, there are five of them in the New Testament, including one about Cornelius, one about Lydia, one about the Philippian jailer, who every time the word of the Lord has been preached in their house, everyone has been converted, everyone has chosen to give their lives to the Lord, and their entire household has been baptized. Household, most often referring to the adults in the house,
because the only thing more insignificant than women in the Jewish culture were children. And there's no mention of what happens with them. And then there was the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. It's one of my favorite stories there, where Philip gets into his chariot with him, preaches the word of the Lord to him, converts the man right there on the spot. They pull to the side of the road. There's a pond of water over there on the side, and he asks to be immersed and baptized immediately. All of these examples of the immersion of believers upon their confession of faith. So here's a question for you. Why is it then that so many of the churches insist that as children, no, no, infants that should be baptized? And that has to do with the belief in just how you and I were born. And we've got a young child in worship and just a perfect example today. It has to do with their belief that each and every child is brought into the world, believe it or not, in a state of sin. For you see, much of the Christian faith believe and adhere strongly to the belief that we are still paying the price for the original sin of Adam and Eve, where they went against the commands of God and did exactly what he told them not to do, as told to us in the book of Genesis thus bringing sin into the world once and for all. In a moment, we'll talk about those who might have been baptized as infants or as children and what that means today. But let me go on to the point that they believe that every child born into this world is born in sin. And if heaven forbid anything were to happen to that child before they had them baptized and their sinful nature washed away, that their entrance into God's kingdom might be in question. Disciples and those of us who baptize believers do not think that way. Disciples look at these tiny children like Zephaniah there, creation of their parents and God, who have not had a chance, nor are they able, to commit a single act of what might be called a sinful nature unless you consider those bad, terrible diapers that some of them have, or, or the nights you stayed up with a child suffering from colic and you were at the end of your rope as to what to do with them. Yeah, those are difficult times. The terrible twos put us to the test. How many remember those times with your children? And the period of time when they learned the word no and use it frequently. But when we talk about these things, are we talking sin? No. And from our study of the scriptures, Jesus does not see those little ones as sinful either. Who remembers a case in point from Mark chapter 9 when the disciples get in trouble for turning children away? How many remember that story there? It's a great one because Jesus gets really upset and I like the fact that he does really show that human side now and then. In this story, the parents are bringing their children to Jesus so that he might touch and bless them and the disciples turn them away. Remember, they were children insignificant in the culture of the day. And Jesus, here's this word, rebukes them for doing so. In fact, it says he is indignant that they are turning the children away. And he says to the disciples, and does this sound like he believes that these children are sinful or sin-filled? Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. And what is the phrase? for to such belongs the kingdom of God. He then goes on to say, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. No, in my opinion, in the opinion of the disciples and how we interpret the scriptures, children are not born as sinful creatures. So there is no need to rush them into baptism. We can wait until they're old enough in our tradition, till they're 10, 11, 12 years of age or older, sometimes into the adult years, until they can express on their own before their church family, their pastor and God, that they understand the difference between right and wrong, 
between acts that are sinful and those that aren't, and what it means to give their life to Jesus. It's at this point that we disciples choose to baptize that person by immersion. And why most all of our churches in one location or another have a baptismal, wherein a pastor can immerse a new believer in life-giving waters. In fact, our baptismal, if you do not know, is located in this beautiful garden to the side. And we have opened the entrance door into the garden area if you would like to take a look at it. The baptismal itself is covered for safety reasons. It's fairly deep, but you're welcome to go and take a look at where we do the baptisms. Now one other point that I must make before this sermon comes to a close, and perhaps some of you have been worried about it throughout the entire service. What pastor if I was baptized in an infant or a child? sprinkled, not immersed. Am I truly fully baptized? Was my baptism authentic? And the disciples say, yes, definitely yes. Because there are three factors that we consider vital in the baptism of someone. First of all, they must be brought forth by a loving, caring family who walks in the ways of the Lord. And that's what happens when parents bring children forward. There must be a, a clergy person, God's representative, his ambassador here, to bring down the blessing of God. And then, of course, the Holy Spirit is present always with us. And so if you were one of those who was baptized, sprinkled as a child or an infant, the combination of that three factors definitely means your baptism is authentic and in the ways of God. Though we disciples today believe when we have the choice that we choose to perform baptism by immersion of believers. Now, there is a lot more that goes into all about baptism and how we do it and why we do it that would fit into an hour-long class if we were having a six-week membership class but I only have a 20-minute sermon and just barely enough time for one baptismal story. Because you see, every pastor has a story about baptisms that go wrong. Now, I don't want to discourage you in case you are thinking about the fact in the weeks to come that you're going to want me to baptize you, because I am happy always to do so. But the First Christian Church of Ventura was a long rectangular church with a glassed-in narthex and as we were coming one sunday morning that we were doing baptisms as we approached we saw that there was water dripping down the windows dripping down from top to bottom and as we opened the door a cloud of steam kind of came out of the sanctuary we knew there was a problem you see, we fill the baptismals on Saturday and then turn the heaters on because being baptized in cold water is like a woo, kind of a, you know, kind of a, yes. So we try to warm the water so it's a more easy transition. Well, the heater had not turned off and it had turned the entire baptismal. We could have boiled lobsters. So here we are, envision everyone who coming, forming a bucket brigade from the baptismal, which was located behind the pulpit here, taking buckets of water, passing it along the way, and tossing it out the side door, while other members ran and got garden hoses to put together to start pouring cold water into the baptismal to try to replace the water we were taking out. Fortunately, we had about an hour to do so, and by the time the baptisms came, the water was warm, sort of like bath water might be. It wasn't quite what we were used to, but it was an experience we remembered from that point on of how we almost parboiled all of our young converts coming into the faith. Now, those don't happen very often, and for people who have never been baptized, or perhaps like myself was baptized as an infant and then chose later in his life to be immersed, I am happy to talk to any of you about that because it is one of the most beautiful rites of the church. And just one of the important things that make us disciples 
And in the weeks to come, we will talk about more things that make us disciples, that make us unique, that helps you to understand why you are a part of this church or why you want to be part of our denomination. Baptism by immersion, by confession of faith, one of the outstanding points that make us who we are. Shall we bow for a moment of prayer? Dear Lord, as we are gathered together today, we ask that each person continually makes a confession of faith to you, that each and every day upon rising, that they take the time to offer their life up to you in service to you and your ministry. Help us to continue to make that difference as we try to make a difference in the world around us. Amen. Next week, there will be three or four items we'll be talking about. And one of them will be this part of the service, which is essentially is an altar call. And we'll talk about what altar calls were like and what they have been in the past and all. And so um, it is something to think about and be ready to hear about why we have altar calls um, and a few other interesting items. Our hymn is My Jesus, I Love Thee, Shall We Sing One and All? offerings. There are so many different ways that people give, and each way is of value. Later today, my wife and I are on the way to Seal Beach, where the largest Lions Club in the country is located. They have a fish bake going on, and they've got music, and they have beverages, and they have just a great thing. They're right along the beach. But in order to put it on, it takes 400 four-hour work sessions to be able to put this event on from set up on Friday till the last things come down on Monday. And when they calculate all the money they have made, which is a substantial, it is only possible because people give of their most precious gift, their time. One of the best things you can do I know in the past I've heard people in my churches be concerned because they could not put a lot in the offering plate. I said there are so many ways to give, so many ways to share. I will take your presence in worship. I will take your helping by doing this or that. I will take your service for one another. Those are all ways that church and God is blessed. 
and that is our tithes and offerings. this day for sending the light and strength of your Holy Spirit. We give you thanks for all the gifts, great and small, that you have poured out upon your children. Accept us with our gifts to be living praise and witness to your love throughout the, all the earth. Through Jesus Christ, who lives with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. So we gather together as we spoke about last week and if you did not hear last week's sermon on communion YouTube Orange Thorpe Christian Church and we come together remembering what Jesus did for us when we talk about giving some people give money some people give time he, he gave his life gave his life so that the sins that we had would be taken away from us and so that a schism that had been created back since the beginning of time with God would be brought back together and open up our entrance into the, the heavenly kingdom when our time comes. And so he said, you know, to his disciples, I want you to remember me each time you break bread. Do this in remembrance of me. When, when you have the cup here of the juice of the grape, this is my blood spilled for you that I loved you so much that I would do anything for you to make your life possible in heaven, and I will give my life for you. Elder? Let us pray. Holy God, you come to us in bread and wine, that we may become more like you. With grateful hearts, we ask that we may not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewal of our minds. Help us to discern your will, to do what is good and acceptable and complete. Amen. Amen. Let us now partake of communion.
the Lord God go with you, be with you, be by your side, and each and every day you live, each and every step you take. Amen.